Hi and welcome to my channel. My name is Magnus and today we're going to talk about network design or security design. You can pick which one you like most. So this is a pretty common design if you have a small network and especially if you have an older network. But you have your corporate network and then you have your internet and between your corporate network and the internet you have your firewall. It doesn't matter which vendor it is. And within your corporate network everything's open. So as soon as you're within the inside the building, then everything is okay and you can reach all your resources no matter where you are. Then there was remote workers and I will say like this, uh, remote workers, it has increased a lot by the, the later year, especially during COVID. Um, but the principle was the same. You did use your client VPN to connect to the corporation and then you're inside the corporation. And when a company grow, they just add more offices and normally you used like IP VPN or you use site to site tunnels. The newest fancy word is sd -Vaughan. It doesn't matter. It's the same principle still. You still have your parameter firewall to protect to the big bad internet. Um, so the principle is the same. Uh, to have security within sd -Vaughan, you need to enable security within sd -Vaughan. Then you can have some more stuff. And then the cloud vendors did arrive, like Microsoft Azure, and then you have AVS. And more or less all companies around the world is using some sort of cloud service for email or for hosting something. Um, and just as a reference, it, it doesn't matter which cloud vendor you're using. All of the cloud vendors has something that is called a shared responsibility table. So the cloud vendor is responsible for like all the physical hardware, like making sure that all the services are up, electricity, water, cooling, whatever. But you are responsible for, well, all the blue stuff here, but especially the network and the firewall configuration. I mean, you don't have physical stuff within your cloud vendors, but you still have firewalls and network that you need to configure. If you don't configure it and leave it as default, well, then you're open for everyone from the internet. So what should be the first step to do something about this? Well, add some inspection points. And my preference is to add inspection points firstly between uh, users and resources, meaning your users and your servers. That's like step number one. So even if I put like a firewall here in the data center, well, at first, maybe you, you don't go for micro segmentation directly. Micro segmentation is when each and every single server cannot communicate with anything until you have like build the rule. So micro segmentation and zero trust go hand in hand. But step number one, just segment your users from your uh, servers or your resources. So what's the next step when it comes to this? Well. I'm just going to move a bit here so we have some more space, but then it's time to check like what sort of devices are the user actually using? Like are they using the, I, the, the laptop or the desktop that is provided by your IT department? Or are they bringing some own device like an iPad or so? The more cloud services you use, the harder it is to control what actual device um, an employee are using but you can you can apply all this sort of stuff that i'm talking about to your vpn or to the cloud things as well so what we're trying to to achieve here is like just because you're within the building just because you're within the company should you be able to use any device that you want or should you be limited to a device that it is providing for you and the reason why you should think about this is like, how do you make sure that the devices are patched? How do you make sure that no one is like going to your building and just taking an outlet and plug in their computer? So you need to protect against physical devices uh, that is not controlled by your own IT department. And this is not only like laptops and computers, it's also regarding guests i mean maybe you should have a guest network within your corporation maybe only have wi-fi but well 
if someone sits in a conference room and just plug in their computer, what happens? Are they within the guest network? Do an employee run forward and just cut the wire? Or do you, do you actually put in the device in a different network because it's not belonging to your organization? And even if it belongs to your organization, how do you do with all IoT devices? And I'm not only talking about light bolts. I mean, should your printer, should your video conference system reach all your resources within your corporation just because they are plugged into a network? And when I say like this, I mean, all devices that is sold more or less now use internet somehow. And they are plugged in even like a toaster is plugged in. And my question to you is like, how often do you actually patch your printers? I mean, and, and then you may say like, yeah, but who should use a printer to attack someone? Well, IoT is something that uh, in the latest years had generated the biggest DDoS attacks because there are so many of them and security has not been the main focus when you're building IoT devices. So one of the biggest DDoS attacks are generated from security cameras. And when everything is connected to your network, well, you have a lot of things and are all actually always patched. Uh, currently, IoT devices or things that is not actually meant to be on the network, but they, in the latest years, they have come to the network because it's easier to control them. They, they can send some information to the vendor and so on. The main focus has not been security and IoT devices is something that you need to protect against. And you also need to make sure that like security cameras, printers, uh, video conference systems, uh, locks, whatever maybe shouldn't reach all of your resources. So how do you actually do that? Well, I would say that you need to implement 802.1x. And this is not something that Checkpoint is providing you with. This is something that you can use like Cisco Ice for. So Checkpoint can use Cisco Ice to build rules. But the segmentation of the network needs to be done in a different way. And what uh, 802.1x can actually do is to uh, decide if this, divides, if this device belongs to your organization. And then it can put like a tag on it or it can put it in a specific VLAN and that VLAN belongs to a specific VRF and that VRF has a specific IP range. So that's why you can segment devices built on what sort of device is it and is it belonging to your organization. And what you should do with this information then is to build your firewalls with identity based security policies. And in my view, you should use what sort of device is it that the user is using and who is the user and what should that user be able to access. So you need a multi-tier approach, meaning if I log into the network, but I sit on my, my iPad, I shouldn't be able to reach everything. But if I still log in, but I sit on my corporate PC, then I should be able to reach, well, what I'm entitled to reach. And when you build something with identity-based security policy, I recommend you to use your Active Directory. So here it will be like, what sort of device are you using? What sort of account do you have? And which AD groups do you actually belong to? And then you can build a rule base based on the AD groups, based on the IP prefix or the device type that you are coming from, and then open your security policy to that specific resource. And this is something that you can apply for VPN as well. It doesn't matter. This is something that you can apply in the cloud environment as well. 
but it requires that you use, in this case, Checkpoint within your cloud. And that's one of the benefits that Checkpoint has compared to other vendors. It's the same type of software that you can install on-prem and in cloud. And it's the same type of management, same type of rules. So it's very easy transaction to actually go from an on-prem to, to a cloud-based uh, environment. So when you're adding a lot of these type of firewalls, like to segment your network, I call them inspection points because Within each inspection points, you can add rules and you can also add functions such as IPS. And this is like the base, the start of it. You can, of course, have multiple firewalls within one, um, one cloud or one data center. You can segment all your application based on VLANs, based on micro segmentation. But if you do like this, at least you have protected I would say a lot. You have fixed a lot of issues that uh, you can encounter because if you limit like SQL access or SSH access to only people on the correct device that should be able to reach it, then you limit the, the impact if you get in like a bot, a virus or an attacker because it's not only a credential that you need. You also need to sit on the correct type of device. So it's like a two factor, so to say. And just, just to mention that as well, all the applications that you are using within your organization, try to use multi-factor authentication with the login because the most common way to get into a network now is that someone is compromising some sort of credential. And it's easier to easier to do that because more and more services are moved to the cloud and users tend to use the same passwords in multiple services. So try to make it as easy as possible for users, but as secure as possible as well. And when you're using identity based security policies, this means that you still have the flexibility for the user because the user can sit on the office, the VPN, it doesn't matter. So you're not building the rule base on an IP address anymore. You're building it on who is the user and what sort of device is the user using. So this gives a lot of flexibility. And as a last slide, I just wanted to show like checkpoints, well, uh, management service, so to say. And I realized that I'm in the way so I will move a bit here, but you can see here that Checkpoint has a really good management software allowing you to control multiple devices, multiple gateways or firewalls from the same view. And you can build rules based on who it is and what device the user is actually using. And it doesn't matter if the gateway is on-prem or in the cloud. And I see that I'm blocking users and device. So let me move here. I move here. So you can see here that in the far left, you have users and devices. So you can use this in the rule base. And I recommend you to use this within the rule base. And if you build your network like this, then you have a multi-tier environment. So you have your onion layers. And it's a lot harder for an attacker to breach your network. And it still keeps the flexibility for the user to actually use stuff within your network, your, in your organization. Because if you build your security super tight and you build it on like, yeah, you need to sit on this workstation in this room and it should have this MAC address, etc., etc. People will not follow it. People will try to find ways around it. And I myself, I work for a service provider. This means that we have like a thousand people that is certified with like Cisco networking. If they want to go around security, I mean, they can just configure stuff and, and change so they have a dedicated 10 gig internet line on their specific workspace. 
So you need to build something that is acceptable for the user as well. So it should be easy and transparent for the user. And that's why you should use dynamic objects in your rule base, because then you are not limited to, to a certain like physical space. Yes, you're limited to what sort of device that you're using and you're limited to the type of access that you should have. If you need more access, you need to apply for that sort of access. And if you're building your rule base then on, on an active directory on AD groups, maybe you have some sort of system that you can apply to be added into different AD groups to get different access. And this also means that the access to the system gives access within the network. So you, so you limit the number of rules that you need to create because, well, this person did move to that office and we didn't have the rules set up for this office. Well, this way you can limit that sort of rules and you still have a great flexibility. And I just need to say like, I have been using this type of um, approach for building networks for the last, I don't know, seven years. And it's quite fun to see people talk about zero trust and how they implement it or how they try to implement it. Because if we go back, many vendors then say like, yeah, you can use zero trust, just purchase our system and it's more or less a VPN. And when you're using it, uh, your zero trust model based on a VPN, yes, you fix a lot, for users, but you don't consider physical equipment such as a printer. So to get a full zero trust, I, I don't say that you need to go there directly. It's, a, it, it's a, a journey. It's something that takes long time and something that you need the complete organization to actually accept. But if you're just using VPNs, uh, if you're doing it to cloud stuff and to on-prem stuff, you're not thinking of like printers, video conference, and all the sort of IoT devices that are coming more and more, like light bolts. So just keep that in mind. And as I mentioned also, Checkpoint can't do this alone. Checkpoint needs to have different things to, to gather information from. And this can be Cisco Ice. And within like the data center itself to get micro segmentation, you can use um, VMware NSX, you can use Cisco uh, ASI, and you can use this together with Checkpoint and get a real nice environment with real flexibility with dynamic objects. And I think that's it. If you want to see more stuff like this, please comment below and uh, please give it a thumbs up and maybe share it. And I hope to see you in the next video. Take care. Bye.